management, especially if any surgery is planned for the patient. Patients with hypothyroidism are likely to have either autoimmune thyroiditis. So in India, of course, you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common cause of uh, goitrous hypothyroidism, we call it. And malignancy also may be associated with hypothyroidism. Again, here there are some unusual situations that you can run into. You can have a thyroid cancer with hyperthyroidism. Uh, we saw that recently in a patient uh, with metastatic follicular thyroid cancer. Rarely the distant mets, so if they're in the bone or the lungs or anywhere else, can be metabolically active. You can have increased peripheral conversion. So you do see um, all sorts of permutations and combinations. But nonetheless, very important to keep all of this in mind. It's also important to have a multidisciplinary approach. So if you do have a good endocrinologist you work with, important to keep them in the loop before you plan any management. If the patient is hyperthyroid, you have to control that before you plan any surgery. Otherwise, it can be quite uh, challenging. Now, what are the signs of malignancy to keep in mind? So, of course, the history associated with malignancy. So if you have a very young patient under 20 years of age, important to think of malignancy. Thyroid nodules in children are more likely to be cancer, differentiated thyroid cancer than benign pathology. Or if you have a patient who's very old, over 70 years, also important to think of malignancy. Very often you can have an anaplastic change in a previous, um, in a, in a either de novo or you can have a malignant transformation into an anaplastic thyroid cancer. Male gender associated with malignancy more than the female gender. Any history of an increase in size or rapid growth, very important. Compressive symptoms like we discussed, any dyspnea, dysphagia, or hoarseness of voice, important to keep in mind. Any childhood history of exposure to radiation. So this is important for papillary thyroid cancers. Uh, the use of Radiation in childhood is a lot less now, unless the, pay, unless the child has a cancer. I think uh, in the previous era, radiation was used for another uh, a bunch of non-malignant indications. So there was a lot more uh, papillary thyroid can cancers associated with radiation, but now it's only usually in pediatric cancer survivors. And then if you have a family history of thyroid malignancies, like MEN2 or the polypus mm -hmm. syndrome, so I'll touch upon that a little later in the talk. Important to think of cancer first and rule it out. If you have nodules that are larger than four centimeter in size, again, more likely to be cancer than non-cancer. Not always, but these are just contributory factors that may or may not help you um, evaluate the patient. Hard consistency in the thyroid nodule, important, more likely to be cancer than not. If it's fixed to the surrounding structures, that's a sign of local invasion. Any vocal cord palsy, immediate, you need to have a high suspicion of cancer. Any regional lymphadenopathy or distant metastasis, it's always cancer until proven otherwise. Now, when we look at the family history, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind. So if you have a patient with medullary thyroid cancer, of course, men syndrome is very important to keep in mind. So as you all know, there are multiple types of men syndrome and the clinical manifestations vary, but these are usually the medullary thyroid cancers that present at an earlier age and are more aggressive. So it's important not only to realize if the patient has an inherited mutation, it's also important to screen the family members. For papillary thyroid cancers, the syndromes associated with uh, PTC can be Pendred syndrome, where you have goitrous hypothyroidism and deafness. You can have familial adenomatous polyposis, Gardner syndrome or putz jager syndrome, which are usually associated with colonic polyps. But rarely you can also have PTC associated with it, so you need to keep it in mind. And for follicular thyroid cancer, you have Cowden's disease and a slightly rare disease called Bane and Riley Ruvalcaba syndrome. So that's associated with the uh, hemangiomas, lipomas, and rarely follicular thyroid cancer. Anaplastic thyroid cancer is very rare and aggressive, thankfully. Uh, can be associated with Werner syndrome, not very common, but there is a link there. Now, when we think of radiological evaluation of these lesions, uh, ultrasound is the primary evaluation for all patients. So it is the baseline evaluation that we use for everybody. 
And the reason why we do it for everybody is because it's inexpensive, it's accurate, and it's non-invasive. So for all patients, I think an ultrasound is the first line evaluation. Even if the patient does have a locally advanced cancer and you plan for cross-sectional imaging, it's usually useful to correlate the ultrasound along with the cross-sectional imaging. So I don't think there's anybody who you would not do an ultrasound in if they have thyroid nodules. It's always important, I think, also to plan for guided evaluations. So what I mean by that is using the ultrasound to guide the FNA is much more useful. Uh, it ensures that the histological yield is better because very often these patients may have nodules that are clinically more apparent, but the less apparent nodules might be more suspicious for malignancy. So what you feel is not necessarily always the most important uh, nodule to sample. So ultrasound gives us a good idea of what area to sample and make sure that we get a good yield for histology. Now, as we all know, the thyroid's classification of thyroid nodules is the standard followed all over the world. There are other classifications, but I don't think any of them are as popular or as widely followed. Thyroid classifies, uh, so the ATA classifies these nodules into five categories, but the American uh, Association for uh, the American College of Endocrinology stratifies them into a much simpler to understand stratification, which is only three tires. So you have the low, intermediate, and the high risk nodules based on radiological evaluation, based on ultrasound. So here, if you look at individual specific features, the sensitivity is quite low. But as you have more and more features associated on ultrasound, the specificity increases significantly. So what I mean is if you have a single feature on ultrasound, it may not be diagnostic. But if you have more and more suspicious features in combination, these are much more specific for cancer. So the ones that are best amongst, I'll walk you through um, the, the thyroid classification, of course. But the ones that probably have the best yield for malignancy is if your nodule has irregular margins, if there are micro calcifications, and if the lesion is taller rather than wide. So these have the highest specificity. Most of the large studies show that that's about 90%. And conversely, uh, if you have cystic or spongiform nodules, the lesion is highly likely to be benign. So if you have a, I'll show you some images. So if you have a simple cyst or you have a spongiform nodule, it's very unlikely that it harbors malignancy. So it's anywhere between 97 to 99% chance of being benign. So this is the American College, College of Radiology thyroid score. So we look at five specific components. So you have the composition of the nodule, sorry. So you have the composition of the nodule, which is cystic or almost completely cystic. So that's what we call a simple cyst with no solid elements. You have the spongiform, again, which is zero point. So both of these have a very low likelihood of being malignant. You have mixed cystic and solid, which means you have a cystic component, but you also have a solid area within the cyst. And then you have a solid or a com almost completely solid, which is two points. So as you go from a simple cyst to a solid component, the likelihood that it is suspicious for malignancy increases. Then you have the echogenicity. So if you have an anechoic nodule, it's again low risk for harboring malignancy. It's only it's zero points. If you have a hyper or a isoechoic lesion, it's only one. If you have a hypoechoic or a very hypoechoic lesion, it's two or three points. So as we all know, hypoechoic lesions in the thyroid gland are more suspicious for malignancy. When we look at shape, if it's wider than tall, it's zero points. But if it's taller than wide, it's three points. So again, this is an important feature. Taller than wide lesions are much more likely to be malignant than those that are wider than tall. Again, when we look at the margin of the lesions, if it's a smooth margin, it's zero points. Ill-defined, zero points. If it's lobulated or regular, two points. Any identifiable extra thyroidal extension is three points. So if it's involving the staph muscles, um, which is essentially what you'll see very well on an ultrasound, then there's a high suspicion of malignancy. Now, again, looking at echogenic foci, depending on what all you can find, so if there are none or large comet tail artifacts, probably likely to be benign. If you have macro calcifications, one point. If you have peripheral rim calcifications, two points. 
or punctate, echogenic foci, or the most suspicious. So that's three points. So the way that it works is you look at all five of them, and the radiologist will will uh, give a score for all five of these, and the composite score is what gives you your final thyroid score. So if you have zero points, it's TR1, which is likely to be benign. There's no need for you to do an FNA. If it if it's a thyroid 2, again, it's not suspicious. If it's thyroid 3, it's mildly suspicious. You do an FNA if it's more than two and a half centimeters in size. If it's four to six, it's moderately suspicious. So you do an FNA if it's more than 1.5 centimeters, follow up if it's more than one centimeter. If it's seven points or more, it's highly suspicious for malignancy. So anything over one centimeter with the thyroid 5, you should do an FNA follow up if it's greater than or equal to five millimeter. So the point here is if it's less than a centimeter, even if it's highly suspicious, you should probably follow it up because the likelihood of getting a good diagnostic yield from a lesion that's less than one centimeter in size is quite low. So these are some of the images that uh, were described here. So this is a simple cystic lesion very smooth margin. So this is very likely to be benign. Okay, 99% chance of being benign. This is what we call a spongiform nodule. So this is what it looks like. Again, 97% or more chance of it being benign. Partially cystic, no suspicious features. So you do have some solid component, but no suspicious features. This is low suspicion. So you have a hyperechoic. You can see the echogenicity of the contents of the nodule but you can see a solid regular margin. This is isoechoic. So if you look at these two echogenicities next to each other, you understand uh, what they mean. So this is a partially cystic with an eccentric solid area. So this is the eccentric solid area that you can see, but again, doesn't really look suspicious. Now, when you look at intermediate suspicion, 10 to 20% chance, you have a hypoechoic lesion with a solid regular margin and a hypoechoic and another lesion which is hypoechoic with a solid regular margin. Now, when you look at the highly suspicious area, so these have a higher than 70% chance of malignancy. Sorry. These have a higher than 70% chance of malignancy. So here you have micro calcifications in a background of a hypoechogenic nodule. And you can see that the margin is irregular here. This is again a hypoechoic nodule with irregular margins. The margins are not well delineated. This is taller than wide, right? So you can see the shape difference. Here again, you can have hypo. This is a hypoechoic nodule with interrupted, interrupted rim calcification. So you can see that there is calcification in the peripheral part of the nodule, but it's interrupted with a soft tissue extrusion. So it looks like it's involving the surrounding areas. And here you have the nodule with an irregular margin and a suspicious left lateral lymph node. So ultrasounds are also good for nodal evaluation. Now, as far as the lymph nodes go, if the size is more than one centimeter or the Solby-RT index is less than two. So this basically tells us if the lymph node is rounded, it's a ratio between the least and the most, the highest, um, uh, it's a ratio between the least and the highest um, measurement of the lymph node. So if it's less than two, if they're punctate calcifications, if the lymph node has mixed echogenicity, a loss of fatty hilum or any peripheral hypervascularity, it's quite suspicious for harboring nodal metastasis. So if you see punctate calcifications in the lymph node, it's likely that you'll see calcifications in the thyroid primary as well. So that's something that you can look at. So if you see a lesion, with uh, suspicious micro calcification in the lymph node. You can take a closer look at the thyroid, you may find the primary. Something new here, relatively new is elastography, which basically is an index of the tissue stiffness. So um, normal thyroid tissue, of course, is less stiff. Malignancy is more stiff. So there are some studies that have shown that elastography can improve the uh, the diagnostic yield of ultrasound and the accuracy in predicting malignancy, but this hasn't been consistent. 
there was one study that showed it was around 33%, so comparable with microcalcifications. But there are also studies that showed that it hasn't been as useful, and there were a lot of false positives. So it's not used in many centers, and we still don't know whether how much value it adds over conventional ultrasound. Now, when exactly do we look at cross-sectional imaging? So ultrasound for thyroid nodules that are restricted to the thyroid gland uh, with limited nodal disease should be enough, but we have to look at cross-sectional imaging when there's clinical suspicion of advanced disease. And what do we mean by advanced disease? It can be an invasive primary cancer or it can be bulky extensive nodal disease. So for both of these, cross-sectional imaging is indicated. It helps us plan management better, especially for planning to operate these patients. It gives us a good idea of what to expect. And it's always very important to be prepared. If it's likely that your thyroid lesion is going to involve the larynx, the trachea, the esophagus, if it's likely to involve one of the vessels, the internal jugular vein, or the carotids, it's very, very important to be prepared to either um, repair one of these structures or to sacrifice them as required. So it's important to go into surgery having a clear idea of what you plan to do, what you're planning to resect, and if you have to repair or reconstruct. So CT and MRI are both good. Uh, they have advantages and disadvantages. CT is uh, preferred very often because it has a shorter acquisition time. Older patients especially are not able to do MRI. They keep swallowing, so you have swallowing artifacts. Uh, MRI is more common, commonly associated with claustrophobia. So many people still use CT, even though MRI has a little better soft tissue delineation. Previously, uh, the conventional teaching was don't do CT with iodinated contrast because the patient is going to get a radio ID scan. It can interfere with that. There was also a small risk of hyperthyroidism in these patients due to iodinated contrast, but most of those fears are unfounded. So if the patient requires a CT scan, if they would always do it with contrast, if you do a CT or MRI without contrast, it's not likely to be of much value. So always do a contrast scan. If the patient is going to need radio iodine, you can defer the radio iodine scan by between four and eight weeks. Uh, you can test to make sure uh, that the urine iodine levels are normal by then, and then it's safe to go ahead. So the interference from a contrast CT four weeks down the line is not likely to be a problem. So here, what we look at specifically, we can look at the infraclavicular area. So if you have bulky lower level neck nodes, you can look at the retropharyngeal area. Again, this can be involved because of a large thyroid gland. It's not uncommon for the thyroid to get enlarged and go into the retropharyngeal area. It can go into the parapharyngeal area, again, bulky nodal disease and mediastinal regions. So if you have a large thyroid gland that's extending into the mediastinum, it's very important to be prepared to manage this. If the patient needs a sternotomy, uh, it should be planned ahead of time. The patient needs to be counseled and optimized. All of these things are very important to ensure good outcomes. Now, when we go to radio iodine, there's no role for radio iodine in a patient who is new thyroid. If the patient has hyperthyroidism, if the TSH is reduced uh, on presentation, there's suspicion that the patient has a toxic adenoma, then there's a role for a technetium scan but uh, otherwise radio iodine, not at all uh, considered preoperatively. Again, PET preoperatively upfront, no role, possibly in anaplastic carcinoma, there's a role. If you're suspecting distant metastasis because you can image the entire body at once. Now the next step is looking at histology. So fine needle aspiration I'm is the sure. single most valuable cost-effective and accurate tool. So FNA is the investigation of choice <laughs> for thyroid nodule. It is quite sensitive. So sensitive between 65 and 98% and specificity of 72 to 100%. So in good hands, of course, uh, you know, with a good cytologist, 
FNA is an excellent tool to arrive at a preoperative diagnosis and to plan your treatment accordingly. Definitely don't go ahead with any surgery unless you have a histology. Ultrasound guidance of where exactly you take the fine needles aspirate from is again helpful. It makes sure that there are no sampling errors. So studies have found that it results in fewer surgeries, reduced cost of care and improves malignancy with the thyroidectomy. So this is pretty much again a frontline investigation for all patients. So this is the Bethesda system, which we all know and have heard about. Now the Bethesda system like Tyrads has been instrumental in standardizing the diagnosis of thyroid nodules. And the reason that has happened is because there have been well-framed objective criteria, which pathologists can follow to arrive at a diagnosis. So the biggest problem with radiology and pathology always in the context of cancer is inter-observer variability. So by laying down very objective and straightforward criteria that the radiologists and pathologists have followed, the diagnosis of thyroid cancer has become reasonably straightforward, at least for differentiated thyroid cancer. It might be harder for the rarer ones like medullary thyroid cancer, which many people don't encounter, non-oncologists and non-oncopathologists don't encounter on a regular basis. But at least for differentiated thyroid cancer, it's become reasonably accurate. So for a non-diagnostic or an unsatisfactory FNA, the risk of malignancy by the Bethesda system is only about 1% to 4%. For a benign, it's about 0 to 3%. If the Bethesda says that it's a benign lesion, for ATP of undetermined significance or a follicular lesion of undetermined significance, it's about 5 to 15%. For a follicular neoplasm, or suspicious for a follicular neoplasm, it's about 15 to 30%. So this again is an important area to realize. So if you have a follicular neoplasm, it's not possible to tell if the patient has a follicular adenoma or a carcinoma on preoperative FNA. So the way that a follicular carcinoma is differentiated from its benign counterpart is if there is capsular or vascular invasion, which obviously cannot be seen on cytology because you need an intact uh, architecture. You need to see invasion into the vessels. You need to see invasion into the capsule in order to make this diagnosis. So if you have a follicular neoplasm, there's a 15 to 30% risk of malignancy. Now, if your Bethesda is suspicious for malignancy, then it's about 60 to 95, uh, 60 to 75 percent, sorry. And if your FNA comes as malignant on the Bethesda system, it has a very high accuracy. So it's 97 to 99 percent. So if you have uh, that your report saying malignant, it's very, very unlikely that the patient doesn't have cancer. Now, in, in addition to FNA for the Bethesda system, FNA is good for papillary thyroid cancer. It's good for uh, meta, uh, it's good for a medullary thyroid cancer. Of course, if you have a slightly experienced uh, cytologist who is used to seeing this, and it can be good for anaplastic thyroid cancer because the appearance is a little bizarre compared to the normal thyroid tissue. It's not very good for follicular adenoma versus carcinoma, you can tell whether it's malignant or not. Also, another test that we can do is we can do thyroglobulin washup for lymph nodes. So for patients with uh, nodal disease where you're not sure whether the nodes are involved by uh, differentiated thyroid cancer or not, you can always do an FNAC and send it for a thyroglobulin washout. If it's less than one nanogram per ml, then it's unlikely to be involved by malignancy. Now comes molecular testing. So for majority of the people is what we call the triple assessment. You have the clinical evaluation, you have the imaging, which is usually ultrasound plus minus cross-sectional imaging, and then you have the FNA. So what's, uh, what's been a relatively recent advancement has been molecular testing. So the problem here with FNA is that Bethesda system is accurate, but very often we are not able to tell whether the patient has malignancy or not. And why this is relevant is because there was a lot of data that came out from, I think, NCDB and SEER that showed that the number of thyroidectomies that were being done for benign disease had increased dramatically over the previous decades. 
And unfortunately, as a result, there was a lot of morbidity associated with benign thyroid surgery. So whether it was recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy or whether it was permanent hypoparathyroidism, the incidence of this was quite high, especially when it was being done by non-expert thyroid surgeons. So there was a shift towards conservative management for thyroid nodules, uh, especially if they're benign. And this is what led to an interest in molecular testing. So as one additional level of information on top of the conventional FNA, whether we could look at molecular testing to tell us whether the nodule we were looking at was benign or malignant. So there are two parts of this. The first is a mutation analysis. So here, these are all based on FNA. So you have uh, an FNA and it, you isolate the DNA from the follicular cells of the thyroid gland, and these are sequenced. So there are two roles here. One is diagnosis and prognosis. So diagnosis, you can uh, determine whether it's likely to be malignant. And the second is if you already have a diagnosis of malignancy or the patient is diagnosed with malignancy based on this test, it gives you an idea about prognosis. So if this test is positive, the patients are more likely to have a slightly aggressive form of the cancer. And by aggressive, I mean more likelihood of it being locally invasive, a higher chance of lymph node metastasis if it's a papillary thyroid cancer, that kind of thing. So for papillary thyroid cancer, specifically what is looked for is red PTC and BRAF arrange rearrangements. So if these are there, it's more likely to be papillary thyroid cancer. And like I said, those with these rearrangements have slightly more aggressive cancers, more locally invasive, higher chance of lymph node meds. Now for a follicular thyroid cancer, the mutations that they look for are the Pax9, PPAR gamma, and the RAS mutations. So these are more specific for follicular thyroid cancers. And for medullary thyroid cancers, RET mutations are the ones that are tested for. So the panel has seven gene mutations. So you have BRAS, you have NH and KRAS point mutations. You have the red PTC and the Pax8, uh, Pax8 PPR gamma rearrangements. So this is highly specific. So 86 to 100 percent specific, but poorly sensitive. The sensitivity is only about 44 to 100 percent. So this is a rule-in test. So if this test is positive your mutational analysis is positive on your seven gene mutation panel, it is likely that the nodule that you are looking at is malignant and requires surgery. So this is something that you offer the patient. If you're not sure whether they need surgery or not, if it's positive, it's likely that the patient needs surgery. If this test is negative, right, it has a poor sensitivity. So it's a rule in test, not a rule out test. But a word of caution here, you can have RAS mutations and follicular adenomas as well. So compared to the red PTC and compared to red mutations, um, RAS mutations are much less specific for follicular carcinoma. The second one is a gene expression classifier. So this is a proprietary algorithm of 167 genes, uh, the companies of Firma. So here, this looks at the MR, mRNA for the benign genes. So this has a sensitivity of 92% and a negative predictive value of 93%, but a low positive predictive value and specificity. So again, this looks at 167 genes. It's proprietary, so we don't know all of the, um, all of the signatures that they're looking for. This is a rule out test. So if this test is negative, it's a high chance that the patient doesn't have cancer and we can avoid surgery. But there's still a 5% risk of a false negative here. So the issue with molecular testing, primarily is the cost issue. Um, in India, they haven't picked up because they're quite expensive. In many cases, the test costs more than surgery. Um, abroad, they're still popular. Not, not all of them are covered by insurance and things like that. Uh, there's significant interest in looking at cheaper, um, more specific tests to reduce the incidence of unnecessary surgery. Still haven't caught on, not sure where exactly they fit in in the clinical management for a patient. Now, moving on to treatment. So since this is management of 
uh, thyroid nodules in general. I'm just going to give you a, a brief outline of treatment. Don't have too much time to delve into it. So for a toxic adenoma, for a toxic multinodular goiter, surgery is the most common treatment. The reason why surgery is the most common is because it's effective. Uh, it only has a 1% failure rate. So patients undergoing surgery for a toxic adenoma or multinodular goiter, recurrence rate, so likelihood of patient developing uh, recurrent symptoms is very low. Whereas radioiodine, when it's, re when it's administered for uh, toxic adenoma or a multinodular goiter is almost 20%. So only 80% of people are treated effectively with one dose of radioiodine. Radioiodine is preferred in patients with advanced age, if, they're, if they have coma with illnesses, if they're unfit for surgery or they refuse surgery, if they have a previously operated or radiated neck, and uh, the absolute contraindication is pregnancy. So a woman with pregnancy obviously can never receive radioiodine therapy because it's teratogenic. Uh, so here, surgery would be the preferred choice unless the patient is unfit or absolutely unwilling for surgery. The dose required for ablation here is quite high. So if it's a young patient, we are definitely worried about the risk of a second primary tumor associated with radioiodine. So we'd be very, very cautious about offering uh, ablation in that setting. Now for papillary thyroid cancers, for a lesion that is less than one centimeter, um, it is a little difficult to diagnose these. However, if you have a good ultrasonologist who can get you an FNA on the lesion that's less than one centimeter, these are called micropapillary thyroid cancers. No, these, uh, so these patients can be offered either observation or surgery. So Ito had a long standing, um, uh, had a long cohort uh, where he followed up patients with micropapillary cancer and he showed that it was acceptable to follow them up uh, with close observation. They may not always need surgery. So observation, if you have the right patient who you can follow up, uh, keep a close eye on them, then observation may be a good option in them. Otherwise, surgery is a good option in them. Uh, if you have a lesion that is one to four centimeter in size, the perennial debate is hemi versus total thyroidectomy. So the thought process here is that in patients with hemithyroidectomy, the incidence of complications is less. Obviously, you can injure only one recurrent laryngeal nerve and uh, hypopyrothyroidism is not an issue and hypothyroidism long-term is not an issue. So the tendency is to do less aggressive surgery for papillary thyroid cancer because the outcomes are so good. However, a word of caution here, uh, it depends on your ability to follow up the patient and how compliant the patient is. So I think personally for me, the policy that I follow is I discuss both options with the patient. And in an Indian context, there are very few patients who are willing to undergo hemithyroidectomy. The issue also here is completion. So if you have high risk features that warrant a completion thyroidectomy, you might have to go back within two weeks and do a completion thyroidectomy. So if it turns out to be a multifocal uh, papillary thyroid cancer, or if you have say LVI vascular invasion, or if you have extra thyroidal extension. So the incidence of that in the Indian scenario can be a little high. There was a study published from Amrita that showed it was upwards of 50%. So 50% of patients who are eligible for hemithyroidectomies based on the size criteria may end up having to undergo a completion thyroidectomy. So still an option, but probably not for every patient. If you have a patient with a lesion more than four centimeter in size, Total thyroidectomy obviously is your treatment of choice. There's no role nowadays for near total thyroidectomy or anything less than that. Um, it is not oncologically sound. When do you address the central compartment with a neck dissection? So if it's a T3, T4 disease, you should address at least the ipsilateral central compartment. If you have lateral compartment disease, again, you should address the central compartment. It's very unlikely to have occult lateral compartment disease. It can happen, but it's not likely. Or if the management is likely to change with your central compartment. So all of these are from the ATA guidelines, fairly straightforward and standard. If it is an invasive papillary thyroid cancer, it's involving the larynx, it's involving the trachea, it's involving 
uh, the esophagus, if it's involving one of the vessels, the sternocleidomastoid rarely, or the staph muscles more commonly, you should always aim for an R0 resection. So an R0 resection is the treatment of choice wherever possible. Uh, so aim for an R0 resection, but plan your resection appropriately. So the patient doesn't end up with a lot of morbidity. And so the patient is mentally prepared for what comes next. It's always important to plan and counsel your patient well. If um, the patient requires radio iodine therapy, um, that obviously is also indicated. So the risk stratification as per the ATA is a good idea here as to whether the patient needs it or not. So, so again, the appetite for radio iodine therapy seems to be less um, nowadays. And the reason for that is because of the risk benefit ratio in low risk cancers. Now, obviously in high risk cancers, there's no option to omit radio iodine therapy, but for low risk cancers, we have to look at the risk benefit ratio. So what is the likelihood that the patient will recur or die if we don't give them radio iodine therapy versus what is the risk from radio iodine therapy, which is that of a second malignancy associated with radio iodine therapy. So that is something we have to balance out especially with the younger age group. So I think, again, this is something that you need to discuss with your patient. Uh, you need to discuss with your the rest of your team and take a call on. So the appetite for remnant ablation in lower risk cancers also is quite low. For younger patients, lower risk cancers, you may not want to do remnant ablation. The advantage of remnant ablation is that you can do post-operative monitoring with thyroid yeah. globulin levels because you've ablated the remnant. But the issue there is that you have the risk of second uh, second malignancies associated with radio ID in patients who may not actually require ablation. So again, this is a little bit of a nuanced area. Still a lot of space for studying risk stratification and personalized treatment. Radiotherapy, there's a role only in gross residual disease. No other role for radio ID, uh, radiotherapy. Now for follicular th carcinoma thyroid, uh, if we have an FLUS, most of us would do a diagnostic lobectomy. If it comes as a follicular carcinoma, then we go back in within two weeks and do a completion thyroidectomy. So that's the standard practice. No neck dissection in a conventional type because as we know, it doesn't spread to the lymph nodes. It has hematogenous spread and distant metastasis. For patients with uh, follicular cancer, more than one centimeter in size, a diagnostic scan is required. So most of them will undergo an ablation, a remnant ablation, and a diagnostic scan is very important to tell us if the patient has any distant metastasis because many of these are asymptomatic. So for follicular carcinoma, of course, uh, there's probably not much of a role for reducing the uh, use of radio ID therapy. This is medullary thyroid cancer, a huge topic um, by itself, but I guess this is just a nice little flow chart, again, from the ADA4 MTC on how exactly we manage these patients. So if you have a FNA, which is diagnostic of MTC, it's important to do an ultrasound of the neck first, do a DNA analysis for red germline mutations. So these patients should go mutation, undergo mutational testing. This is important to tell us if they have hyperparathyroidism as well and evaluate them for pheochromocytomas. Because if you plan them for surgery and it turns out they have a pheochromocytoma, they could end up having a higher risk of mortality on table. So this is something that you have to rule out in all of your patients with medullary thyroid cancer. So based on the serum levels of calcitonin, we stratify these patients. So if the calcitonin levels are less than 500 nanograms per uh, sorry, less than 500 picograms per milliliter, then uh, we do a total thyroidectomy with or without a cervical lymph node dissection, right? Uh, many of these patients, we stage with an evaluation of the neck, evaluation of the thorax for mediastinal lymph nodes, and of course, evaluation of the abdomen. So uh, either an ultrasound or a triple phase D to look at the liver for distant meds because we know this is where medullary thyroid cancer can spread. If it's less than 500, then your surgery is probably uh, more conservative, may or may not do a lymph node dissection. But if it's more than 500, then you need to look at um, distant metastasis. Very important to look for that. 
because again, it can be occult and you have to treat appropriately. If the calcitonin levels are high, if there's extensive nodal disease, uh, if there's redu residual disease, you're not able to do an RZ resection, there's probably a role for external beam radiotherapy. Again, not very good level, high level evidence for this, but it's something to consider because if the patient, so the thought process is if, if the patient recurs here, they're unlikely to be salvaged. So even if it's not necessarily of great benefit, um, it, even if it's an incremental benefit and it prevents the patient from recurring, might be valuable. If the patient has um, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, important to reset that as well. Uh, R0 resection wherever as possible, wherever possible. If the patient has distant metastasis, then you treat them with systemic therapy. So with uh, TKIs or put them in a clinical trial. Anaplastic thyroid cancer, most aggressive, one of the most aggressive cancers in humans. Whatever you do for these patients, unfortunately, one year survival is around 20%. So surgery here is an, off, is an option only if R0 resection is feasible. So not many of these patients come with resectable anaplastic thyroid cancers. You're lucky if you get a patient who is resectable. Very often it involves everything, whether it's a larynx, trachea, esophagus, prevertebral fascia, keratids. So no value in doing an R1, R2 resection. Absolutely no idea. Uh, no idea why you would do this because these tumors grow very fast and uh, it's likely that the patient could even have a recurrence before they go home. Um, so the idea here behind surgery is not necessarily to improve survival. We are not quite sure if surgery improves survival because we don't have very good data on this. But quality of life definitely is the thought process here. So if you can reduce all of the disease, if you can remove all of the disease with an RZ resection and give the patient a given therapy, even if they die of distant metastasis, the quality of life is far better than a person who dies with local disease, local regional disease, because that is a miserable death associated with a lot of suffering. So adjuvant therapy here, again, uh, some people have used cisplatin, some people have used uh, doxorubicin, some people have used conventionally EBRT, some people have used hyperfractionation. Uh, all case reports, small series, uh, different ranges of survival. Something a little more, um, uh, a little more encouraging has been uh, targeted therapy. So if the patient has BRAF mutations, dabrefenib and trametinib have been used. Uh, some patients have good so good uh, outcomes with this. So patients who do respond, respond well, and they've had durable responses, which is uh, excellent news. Not something that we saw in anaplastic thyroid cancer before this. And of course, for PDL1, one uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab have been used. Again, not a great deal of patients, but some encouraging uh, use. So I think that was just a broad overview. Hope I gave you some idea of um, what the thought process is while evaluating these patients. Uh, happy to take any questions, doubts, comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Narayan. Uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, I think you made, actually, it is a very long topic and you made it uh, quite uh, small and explained it so well. So request if answer. anyone... If anyone has any question, can directly ask also. So one question, Dr. Narayana, I have that how often do you do radionucleotide scan nowadays? Um, yeah, sorry, I can hear you. How yeah. often do you do? Radionucleotide scan nowadays for your thyroid nodules. Um, as in pre preoperatively? Yes, yes, preoperatively, right. Uh, almost never. So unless the patient has uh, hypothyroidism, we, we would never do them actually. Yes, yes. I think that's an important point because I think our earlier learning was like that, that it was one of the important component of pre-op investigation. But nowadays, uh, we have to select the case and we have to do it only for the hypothyroid cases. So I Correct. think, uh, Dr. Narena, there are two cases in the chat box, uh, two questions in the chat box. If you could please take them. Why yes. is the minimum surgery in thyroid hemithyroidectomy? Why not wide excision with margin like in CA tongue? Yeah. I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but what my thought process would be that 
removing the one half of the thyroid gland is a standardized operation and uh, we are likely to execute it well so you have the superior pedicle you have the inferior pedicle you have the middle thyroid vein and if you go through the isthmus it's probably a bloodless reproducible operation i don't know if you could do a wide excision like you can see a tongue but i think a hemithyroidectomy is a standardized operation that we can all do in a repeatable neat fashion without much bleeding without much morbidity i don't know if we could manage to do that like a wide excision yes i agree completely i think uh, another question dr narayana there is in a 19 year old female with papillary thyroid carcinoma with nodes in the right level 4 uh, present what will be the treatment options available so i would definitely offer surgery up front uh, patients um, under 50 years with differentiated thyroid cancer even if they have metastatic disease are curable so definitely a total thyroidectomy a central compartment neck dissection and a lateral compartment neck dissection followed by radioiodine therapy so this patient definitely is very curable uh, should op- operate followed by radioiodine therapy this gives them the maximum chance of cure i think there is one more question on the chat box uh, any cut off for urine urinary iodine levels before taking up for radio iodine so i think this varies from nuclear medicine person to nuclear medicine person depending on specialists uh, in india i don't know if we have a specific cut off so i think most of the labs if it's um, if it's below a certain level if it's not detected uh, that's what most nuclear um, medicine specialists would say but uh, i'll check up on that and get back to you lala i'm not 100% sure but if it's not detectable if most of the labs it's not detectable that should be more than enough post op how often do we do yeah. iodine scan iodine scan so i think i think this um, this is where the dynamic risk stratification is very important for um you know if you go through the ata dynamic risk stratification it's important to realize that over time this may change I think now with diagnostic radio iodine scans uh we do them less often at least personally uh there will be a diagnostic so for a high risk patient we would probably repeat at 6 months and go from there uh otherwise i'm happy for many patients just following up with suppressed thyroglobin levels so i think this is something that you have to decide sitting with the patient sitting with your nuclear medicine specialist i think this is something that you have to do on an individualized basis i don't think like we have for oral cancer for example where we have you know like the esmo guideline saying to do a scan every 6 months for an advanced oral cancer i don't think we are going to have a blanket guidelines like that i think as time goes most of the recurrences happen within the first 18 months 80% recur within the first um 18 months so after that as long as your tg levels are low your ultrasounds are fine i think the number of radio iodine scans you do can drop down drastically you don't have to keep doing them there are lots of questions yeah on radio <laughs> iodine radio <laughs> iodine scan and ablation yeah. therapy so it's a dose right so basically the dose of radio iodine used is what's important So if it's a low dose scan the idea is it's a diagnostic scan it shows you if um it shows you if there's any uptake anywhere else in the body and the ablative dose is obviously higher so you know 100 150 millicuries is the standard ablative dose but your diagnostic scans are much lower so the idea is basically many people may even omit omit the ablation so you do the diagnostic scan initially if the diagnostic scan is not showing disease then don't ablate uh 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 hi uh, it was a nice hi, presentation hi thank you it was a nice presentation uh, but i just uh, had one uh, uh, i i wanted to uh, know actually that uh, do you uh, routinely in house uh, review your fnas which if they have been done from outside do you have your own uh, set of database which you are maintaining to 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 predict the uh, the batista uh, staging or, uh, or 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 any experience on that uh, or do you take any from a reputed lab uh, how how do you generally go about uh, the if it is basically when when whenever there is but is a 3 to 4 i think that's a very good question uh, if you have a patient with a batista 3 or 4 you're not sure do you proceed based on that um, i think 
there are two aspects to this. One is how well does the Bethesda fit with the rest of the patient? Uh, you know, what are the clinical features? What are the ultrasound features? Very important. Second thing is, uh, I look very carefully at whether it was ultrasound guided or not. For me, that's a bias. I'm not 100% sure whether that's uh, something everyone should follow. But if it's a guided FNA, I'm more likely to follow it. If it's not a guided FNA, I'm less likely to follow it, more likely to repeat it. Um, I, my threshold for repeating is quite low. So if it looks like a malignant lesion, it's quite typical of malignant lesion, both clinically and on ultrasound, I may not repeat. But if it's more benign and I want to observe, then I would repeat because our cytopathologists are very good. So I'm very comfortable with going whatever they say. So if I'm going to intervene and it's clear that I need to intervene, then I may not um, poke the patient again. But if I'm more likely to observe, but we haven't been doing, to answer your question, we haven't been doing that in a structured fashion. Probably we should be doing that. Interesting to look at. Uh, so, Dr. Narana, just to add at TMX, usually we see that usually if it is a like inconclusive or uh, then usually we also go ahead and do a repeat FNA. Uh, yes. But usually in cases of AUC where we know they have been able to get enough cells and still they have not been able to make the proper diagnosis. So in yes. those cases, usually we also go ahead and do it depending upon the clinical and radiological findings. I mean, in fact, Correct. like in your previous answer, you already said it is at least has to be minimum of hemithyroidectomy. So the standard surgery almost remains the same. Correct. So, I agree completely. Yeah. So I think uh, there are other two, three more questions. Lot of questions, Dr. Narena, for your class. <laughs> so that means <laughs> it's good or bad. I don't know. Yeah, Either it's way. very good. It's very good. Very good. So uh, students are very much interested. So uh, can you please take so your... Uh, when do you also? prefer to address level one in thyroid cancer? So only if it's involved. I have seen a few cases with submental lymph nodes and things like that. Um, that was a little bit of an unusual case that we managed. That was thyroid, that was PTC in a thyroglossal cyst. You don't see level one A commonly involved. I have seen a few cases with one B. So I would always look at this cancer. If the patient has contiguous lymph node involvement, it's likely that it's involved. You can always do an FNA of the 1B to make sure that it's actually that and it's not a reactive node. Uh, the textbooks say that 1 is almost never involved with thyroid cancer, but we have seen cases with 1A and 1B. So the 1A, the only case I've seen with 1A was when it was a, uh, it was a PTC arising in a thyroglossal cyst that had spread to the submental lymph nodes. 1B, I've seen a few patients with it. So if you're doubtful, get an FNA done and address it if it's involved. So only if it's involved and you have a suspicion that it is involved, uh, either you know with contiguous lymphadenopathy on the ultrasound, or if you're doubtful, do an FNA of the node, usually the, you'll get a good answer on that. Hemi or total thyroidectomy for 60 year male with Bethesda 4 for three centimeters and other side a TR3 nodule of one centimeter. So I think this, um, is probably not a very good patient for a hemithyroidectomy unless it's a very compliant patient, unless they are willing to undergo a completion and they are not very worried about follow-up and cancer. So I think these are probably the cases where the patient-related factors are very important. How likely a patient is to come for follow-up, you know, because the idea here is that if the patient, for example, develops a thyroid cancer on the other side or they recur that you intervene. Now, unlike squamous cancers, for example, when the patients recur in differentiated thyroid cancer, you have enough of a lead time to intervene, but as long as they look, as long as they follow up, if you will. So I would say that nine or eight times out of 10, it would be a total. Uh, the two out of 10 times where we would consider hemi would be either if the patient was quite high risk, you know, um, or if the patient was a very compliant, sensible patient, willing to be kept on close follow-up, not worried about, uh, you know, not much cancer phobia and things like that. So I think it's going to be a little different for everybody, but you need to have discussions with the patient to understand what they want also. 69-year-old asymptomatic male, anti-TPO is high, 166, TFT is normal, has solitary nodules, 7.5 millimeters into 6.2 millimeters on ultrasound. Triad score, category three, how to proceed? Nodule is hypoechoic on left lobe. So I think observing this patient is reasonable. 
IATA says that if it's less than one centimeter in size, don't stick a needle in it. I think it's reasonable to follow up this patient carefully. Because all of those hypoechoic, all of the tyrads criteria, you have to realize that uh, um, they become a lot more subjective in smaller nodules. If you have a nice big nodule and you have the tyrads criteria and you apply them as they're meant to be applied, the, um, the diagnostic yield is a lot better. As the nodules get smaller and smaller, these features are harder and harder to appreciate. And as a result, uh, the, your ability to accurately interpret them comes down. So you may get that wrong. So I would say reasonable to follow up patient. So I think, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Narayana. Uh, lot of questions, uh, you answered them one by one very patiently and uh, we are really thankful to you. And uh, with this, I think we'll conclude today's lecture. And uh, just to update, uh, tell the residents and the participants that we'll be having uh, one lecture on nucleotide scans also uh, uh, this uh, is subsequently. So I understand that there is a lot of questions on radio iodine part and we'll definitely take on uh, that also. So with this, I once again, thank you, Dr. Narayan. Thank you, thank you. Really enjoyed this. <laughs>